<clears throat> if you would look at the passage of Scripture, which is, we can't read all of it, it's m one of the longest uh, chapters <clears throat> we have in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1. I'm not reading all the verses of it. <clears throat> But this is a chapter on Advent. It has to do with all that went prior to <clears throat> the birth of Jesus, which in Luke is recorded in chapter 2. In, in the incarnation, and incarnation simply means uh, enfleshment, that Jesus took on himself human flesh. In coming into the world to partake of and to clothe himself with human flesh, with humanity. Humanity played a great part in that. <clears throat> Humans, we know in Scripture, were vehicles for that incarnation, were heralds of it. God used humans to tell about this, though in a large degree they weren't sure what they were saying. And he used humans involved in all of Advent, this leading up to the birth of Jesus, as an illustration of what Jesus came to redeem. So we're we're involved in this. Though we're the objects of redemption, God involves us in that redemption and in the announcement of that coming redemption. We are heralds of it. We're vehicles of it. We're illustrations of why he had to clothe himself with flesh and come to this world. In Luke, we will look at Two visits by one angel, the angel Gabriel, and in chapter 1 of Luke, I believe the last time we see Gabriel is in the book of Daniel, centuries and centuries before this. <clears throat> and here he appears in Luke 1 to two different individuals. In those two different individuals... Of the three things that God used humans for, heralds, vehicles, illustrations, we'll see the latter. The two people that Gabriel appeared to are illustrations of why Jesus came, what he came to do, and what his salvation looks like in a human in, beginning with verse 5, we are introduced to Zacharias. So we'll begin reading in 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. The priests were divided up by their clans within the tribe of not only the Levites, but then the household of Aaron. <clears throat> and he was of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. That was the little golden altar that sat inside the holy place in the temple and it sat uh, right against the veil and behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. The high priest only entered there, and that just once a year. The other priests 
would draw straws to see who performed the duties that were in the holy place. The placing of the showbread on the table, the lighting of the um, lamps, and offering incense several times a day, which signify prayer that's on the little altar of incense that sat right before the veil. It was customary in drawing, you know, casting lots to see who got to go in there, that you could serve. Priests generally served and Levites would serve from age 30 to 50. Priests would serve longer. Levites were the 30 to 50. Some of the priests were um, in shorter before they retired. You might have, might have, one chance in a lifetime that you ever got the long straw and so you went into the Holy of Holies to offer the incense. This was a momentous occasion for him. So he, by lot, was chosen and he goes in to offer the incense on the altar and the whole multitude of the people in verse 10 were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not fear, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Very briefly, verse 15, the prohibition against any alcohol had meant that John was to be a Nazarite. I won't go into any more detail, but that's a a special um, order, if you want to call it, group of people that were completely dedicated unto God from, most cases, from birth. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. That's a quote out of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. We'll end our reading there on Zacharias for a moment. I want to see three things about Zacharias. And this first passage gives us 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6, if you'll look at that, he has a stellar commendation from God. Here's God's description of he and his wife. He was properly from the uh, family of Aaron, and then in 6, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Now, that's not a bad endorsement. I'd like to have that, and I hope to have that from God, and I hope, I'm sure you do too. This is a perfect endorsement from God himself. They were righteous in the sight of God. So, first thing, Zacharias had a life of devotion. There's no question that he lived his whole life followed God's commandments, was righteous in God's sight, which meant that he was not fulfilling them outwardly. As the scripture says, 
you serve me outwardly, you honor me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. Not the case with Zacharias. God knew he was sincere. This is, this is a great endorsement. <clears throat> Second, he received a tremendous revelation from a, a being, Gabriel. And it says here, Gabriel says about himself, I stand in the presence of God. The, the word here is just a small thing, but the word here is by. I stand by God. So in the, in the throne room of heaven... Gabriel stood right by God, awaiting his commands, ready to do his will and carry out whatever assignment God gave him. This is not, uh, this isn't somebody that is the parking lot attendant, okay? Having nothing, I don't want to offend the parking lot attendants. This man, this angel, this being, stood by God. So the revelation he receives is from none other than Gabriel. And when He didn't know it initially. It's been about 400 years at least. We call them the silent years between the Testaments and the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, Gabriel quotes that, and that's the first verbal sound from God in 400 years. Zacharias gets to hear, because it says there was no vision from the Lord, there was no word from the Lord between Malachi, the end of the old, and the beginning of the new. And as I mentioned, Gabriel, last we heard of him, was in the book of Daniel. God breaks his silence to you have the entire world of people and he breaks his silence of all those centuries to a guy named Zacharias. What a privilege. Then what did he tell him? Your prayers have been heard. They've been praying for a child. Said, I've heard your prayers. We're not only going to give you a son, but it's so certain that here's his name. And he told him that because the name John has a, was a name not used in Zacharias's family. And you always named them um, in some relative's memory. So he makes the point. You name him John, which is out of, out of the norm for that particular family. You name him John. Then he says... He's going to fulfill the word of God. And he quotes the scripture here that he will turn the hearts of Israel back to God. And one of the very last phrases of Malachi is that he, the coming Christ child, but also the forerunner, John the Baptist, in the spirit of Elijah, would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons. So he quotes scripture and says, you're going to have a son is, who is the fulfillment of the final word, the last word that Israel's heard 400 years ago. That's who you're going to have born to you. It'll be a high honor to you and Elizabeth. That glory will come from this son. What's his response? How will I know this for certain? Now what is in that statement? There's two things there. One is unbelief. Two is arrogance. The off, the, he acknowledged it was an angel because he was scared. And he says to this, granted, he doesn't, he, he knows he's an angel, he doesn't know the rank. But he looks at this angelic being this is this is a supernatural appearance and he says your evidence that you've offered to me first that you're an angel second that you know what i've been praying my wife and i for years third 
you are so specific, it'll, it's going to be a boy, and here's his name. Fourth, he will fulfill Scripture, you, Zacharias, as a priest. No, you've read it. And his basic response is, that's not enough evidence for somebody of my standing. You understand? That's not sufficient. What? <laughs> Moments earlier, just at the appearance of Gabriel, he'd apparently been ready to fall to the floor. Fear, it says, gripped him or fell upon him. And now here he is saying, how am I going to know? Everything you've told me is not sufficient. I want more. How in the world... <clears throat> How in the world is this the same man of verses 5 and 6? Kept all the commandments of the Lord all of his life blamelessly. What in the world is wrong here? Is this man a closet sinner? No, not at all. In the sight of God, he was righteous. His deeds were right. That's what it means. His standing with God, God had no quarrel with his outward behavior and his sincerity in doing it. Where in the world did this come from? What kind of spontaneous reaction is this? This is an illustration. It is a perfect illustration of why Jesus had to come, had to die, had to defeat Satan and sin and be able to eradicate that spontaneous inclination of the two-sided coin of unbelief and pride. This is an illustration of what's the matter with the whole human race. Even though this man is clearly righteous, he still has that plague in his heart. In the Old Testament, Solomon, at the dedication of the temple, prayed and made this statement among a lot. But he said, when anyone's praying here in this house and sees or knows the sore or plague of his own heart, notice how this was also revealed to Zacharias. He wasn't in a revival meeting where the preacher was preaching on entire sanctification. Telling believers they need to get a pure heart. He was alone. The privacy of prayer. Performing the, uh, the offering of incense which typified praying. It's in the deep, quiet, private interaction with God that God smoked his heart out and showed him what was there. To some degree, I wonder if Zacharias wasn't surprised himself. What in the world did that come from? Why, why is it likely that he thought that? Didn't seem to have any chance to choke it off. It just came out. It's because it's an inherited inclination. There are two things here quickly I want us to think about. Intentions, inclinations. Intentions involve knowledge and will. It involves motives. But an intention I know about. I intend to do such and such. Now, it can be that an intention is deeply hidden. And on the surface, I act a different way, but I have different intentions. We recognize that all the time. 
We assume in situations that a person's intentions are not what they pretend their outward behavior is. Intentions generally cannot overcome inclinations. Inclinations are deeper down and farther back than intentions. Inclinations are revealed in reactions often, as in this case. Inclinations are the, the set of our, of our soul. It's the grain of our soul. And the grain of the human heart is unbelief and arrogance. And from that comes all the other fruits of that. Rebellion, disobedience, and so forth. But the core issue is that we inherit. I, you may be sick of hearing that. But one of these days, I will, you know, move to the legacy, and you won't have to hear it anymore, okay? But until I do, if we don't understand that fundamental core issue of the disease of the soul, the cure never makes any sense. I am born with a spontaneous, involuntary bent to unbelief, to arrogance, to sinning, to rebellion. It is played out in the Garden of Eden. We see it in Adam and Eve's decisions, and it remains in every human that's born into this world. So in facing Zacharias, and in, in Luke's, um, he, he's always looked at as a tremendous historian. He even gets so detailed that he tells the angel was standing on the right-hand side of the little altar. That's how particular of a historian he is through the Holy Spirit. God, if you want to look at it, Zacharias is held up to eternal embarrassment for how he reacted here to what the angel subsequently says, I was sent with good news. Your heart should have leaped for joy. Instead, that's not good enough evidence for me. How am I going to know this for sure? You understand me? That's in the heart, even if we qualify before God by our sincerity of obeying Him as righteous. How is it possible that you can be righteous in the sight of God and still have this kind of an inclination? It's because we are, when we're converted, <clears throat> we are made holy but we're not entirely holy. There is a separation from the practice of sinning, setting us apart from the life of rebellion that is called holiness. But I'm not holy, holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y, H-O-L-Y, okay? I'm not, in, that's why Paul prayed. The Holy Spirit prayed through Paul for the Thessalonians. I pray that the very God of peace, people he had just said were flourishing in faith, their love overbounded, uh, they were people of God, no question about it. He said, I pray that the very God of peace would sanctify you entirely. He earlier speaks to them as being sanctified. But they're not sanctified entirely. They've dealt with, through the blood of Christ, one element of the sin disease, which is the verb, sinning. But God, having gotten that taken care of, zeroes in on this is the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem, technically, is not the sinning. It's a heart that's bent to it that is 
deeper down and hidden in a foundational way. It came out here. Maybe even to Zacharias' own surprise. So the Lord, in His mercy and goodness, because He's not going to write us off, He's not going to condemn us and throw us away, He says to him, in 19, through Gabriel, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The condemnation from God, which followed the commendation, you're righteous, keep my laws blamelessly. Now now he has a measure of condemnation. You didn't believe me. I, I, I got to watch my time here, but there is a difference between lack of faith and unbelief. Lack of faith is the faith we have that is capable of being matured, stretched, increased, deepened through experience and through seeing God do over and over again. Pure faith, however little it is of a mustard seed, is capable of virtually infinite growth. Unbelief is not lack of faith. Unbelief is a positive, and I don't mean positive as good, but it's, it, it is a positive inclination to disbelieve. Therefore, we find an illustration of unbelief rather than lack of faith. Unbelief is what's in the hearts of those who stood at the foot of Calvary after three years of seeing Jesus feed the 5,000 walk on water, heal the blind, heal the deaf, heal the maimed who were missing limbs and they came home with an arm and who raised the dead and they said, well, if you come down from the cross, we'll believe you. No, they wouldn't. They never do. There is no evidence sufficient to convince unbelief. That distinction has to be clear. You can't, you can't grow this thing out of your heart. Christian maturity, the irony is people say, well, the more mature you get, the less and less of the inherited sinful nature you have. The inherited sinful nature prevents maturity. It prevents growth and grace. So growth and grace can't grow that out of your heart. It keeps growth stymied and stunted. God illustrates that. That's what he's after. That's what he wants to get at. Now, let me just finish quickly with Zacharias. There's more that's meant than he won't talk. I think when it says here, you'll be silent, I I think it means you'll live in a world of silence. Because he wasn't only struck with the inability to speak. We know when John was born... And they said to Elizabeth, what's his name? Says the angel says it's going to be John. That's John. He says, well, you know, you've got nosy neighbors and relatives, basically, is what you've got. You've got in-laws saying, well, there's no one named John. <laughs> you know, leave us alone. But that's what you got. Well, you can't call him John. And they said, notice what they did to Zacharias. They made signs to him what's going to be his name. He couldn't hear either. Often, lack of speech is aligned with hearing loss. But at any rate, he, he, was both, he was struck both deaf and unable to speak. And so they made signs to him. What are we going to name him? He gets a tablet and writes, John. Now, somewhere, somewhere in all this time, Zacharias' heart had changed. I don't have time to read it, but you ought to. We'll read somebody, when you get a chance, read it, beginning in about verse 66 or somewhere in there, is it said he was filled with the Spirit 
and his tongue was loosened, and you have that long prophecy and praise of God that goes down to verse 79 in, in Luke. I don't know what happened to him, but God did a work in his heart when he finally regained his hearing and his uh, language. He was a different man. Now, let's shift to the second person that Gabriel went to. He also, we find here in verse 26, in the sixth month, that's the sixth month, of Elizabeth and Elizabeth Zacharias's wife's pregnancy, okay? The angel Gabriel, we see him again, was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Coming in he said to her, "Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you." But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, you, I, I'm reading New American Standard, and if you have one with footnotes, how can this be since I am a virgin? Other versions, and this footnote here, how will or how shall this be? I don't think I'm reading too much into it because we know what comes subsequently. But this is not, well, how's that? How are you going to do that? It is, how will you do this? It's, it is a question of faith. It's not a question that is marinated in unbelief. Well, how are you going to do that? It's not that kind of question at all, even though similar words to Zacharias. How, well, Lord, how in the world are you going to do this? Not that you can't. I'm just curious, how are you going to pull this off? There's a difference. We sense it here. Now, he, and, and notice, the, the angel Gabriel, obviously, knew the source of Mary's question, was not unbelief, because of his answer. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. She who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, Looking at, let me just give you, which I brushed over too quickly. Zacharias had a life of devotion, discovered a leash of doubt. It hindered him from reaching out and trusting God. It was like he was on a short lease and it was doubt. It was unbelief. It was arrogance. Well, how are you going to do that? But finally, we find him, which I can't read the scriptures, I don't have time. The language of deliverance. His heart's different. He's let go of this hindering leash of doubt. Now, we look at Mary. And in Mary's um, statement here in verse 38. Behold, Lord, look upon me, the handmaiden, the bond slave of the Lord. What? Now listen. I think we all know this. I don't have to belabor it. You have a child apparently out of wedlock. You're done. You're done. I can't describe to you in that culture. You're done. For your life. You're done. That's why Joseph, finding that she was with child, said, because he was a just man, didn't want to pour 
the community scorn on her because he cared for her, but he was a good man. He said, I'll put her away. I'll divorce her secretly. I don't want her held up to public scorn. But there's no question in Joseph's mind about whether he should divorce her. You have to. This is unacceptable. And she would never be married again. She would be an outcast. She would have no, no way to earn a living. I mean, for her to say, thy will be done. We don't, I don't have the ability to describe to you how deep a cost in her mind it was to say, thy will be done. Behold your handmaid. You do with me what you want. That's beyond, I think, our ability to grasp it. Thy will be done. That's a different heart than Zacharias. Her response was a, a believing question. Lord, how are you going to engineer this? And then it was, thy will be done. Mary, contrasting with Zacharias, resigned herself to God's will. She was resigned. Lord, your will be done with all the cost that she believed would happen. Remember, we know the rest of the story. We know the rest of the story. She didn't. All she could picture was what she, she had grown up. Seeing people who were outcasts. Remember when Jesus ran into the woman at the well and it was at noon? Nobody went to the well at noon except people like her. She'd had five husbands, was living with her sixth boyfriend or whatever. That's why she went out at noon. Nobody would have anything to do with her. She'd seen that. Mary grew up seeing people whispering and pointing and somebody going down the street with a shawl over their face. I'm going to have to be like that if I okay this, if I agree to it. All right, Lord, I'm your handmaid. That's a heart that's pure, that is utterly committed to God. She was resigned to God's will. Then we find in the 45th verse, can't go into all this, she visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth um, prophesies to her and makes this statement. Verse 45, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has been spoken to her by the Lord. So she believed. That's the opposite of Zacharias. She believed his word. So she resigned herself to his will. She relied on his word. And then finally, beginning with verse 46, which I cannot read all that, that's called the Magnificat, and that is her praise of God for what he's doing. And remembering, remember this, she still is thinking in terms of, she doesn't know the rest of the story like we do. Just the first few verses. Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. Man, what a statement. Here's where faith did give her some foresight. And after hearing a second prophecy from Elizabeth about her, she said, it isn't going to be as bad. It isn't going to be what I thought. God's going to do something here. I don't know it yet, but she's able to say, I trust him so much. Who says this? I know that generations from now, they will be praising me for what I've done, for what God's done, which we know is true. There's a contrast then. In Zacharias, that's what Jesus came to remedy. Mary is an illustration of what he can do. Lastly, then, let me just say this. Is, this, is somebody like Mary extraordinary? Is she um, unusual? No. 
Not at all. Jesus made it very clear through the rest of the Gospels. He said, what, what do you have to do to be a disciple? Take up your cross, meaning die to yourself. Abandon rights, supposed rights to yourself. You serve me, you follow me. Come to me, take up your cross, follow me. There, this is a good contrast of what he came to fix and what it looks like in a real life. It means it's possible for us. It's available. Let's bow our heads and Jessica will lead us in some closing music. Father in heaven, may we recognize what it is that you came to remedy. May we also realize that this pollution of the heart is severe and serious enough that it, it called for the death of no one less than God to remedy it. But you can remedy it. You can remove that inclination from our hearts to where we can spontaneously say, Thy will be done. We pray, Lord, that you would just search our hearts, give us open hearts, give us light, and help us walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen.